um, beamed out to every individual living unit and uh, they just sit in their jammies and dressing gown and slippers and just watch it on the TV. It's pretty hard to make a change after you've been doing that for a few months. <laughs> but slowly they're coming uh, back to fellowship together and that's what I say to them. I said, you know, it's he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the man of some is. But so much more as you see the day approaching. If ever we should be making effort to come to worship, it's the times in which we live, I'm sure you understand that. Uh, Ashley just reminded me of something in his introduction this morning. And I think he might have been the culprit, actually, but I better not be too hard on that. But at camp at uh, Lofus Paradise in Rotorua, um, we had tents and canvas stretches for them to sleep on. Um, and I was always last to bed. They knew that. And when I came to get in my bed in, the, in this big tent, it was just absolute silence. And you know, when a youth worker goes into a tent of boys and it's quiet, you can be sure there's something going on. That's not true for the girls' tent, by the way, but it certainly is for the boys' tent. So I, um, I just put two and two together and put my hand on the, my sleeping bag on top of the canvas stretcher and I knew what they'd done. So I never said a word, just got changed, laid on top of my sleeping bag with my legs straddling the lower section and my arms straddling the top section and just laid there quietly because they'd put a canvas stretch in and it was split right down the middle. They were waiting for me to get into it and go through, and I didn't. And boy, did that annoy them. Dude, the silence didn't last long. They soon broke the silence and they realized that I'd found out what they were up to. So I remember that now, actually, I think you might have been in it. Oh, he's saying no, 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 but I'm not sure. I was sleeping in um, the boat. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't know about that. You could have easily done it before you went there. <laughs> I'm away to you, young fellas. It's all right. Oh, well, I mustn't detain you too long on that, but it just reminded me of, of that experience that night. That's the same camp when one of the young folk parachuted in. Do you remember that? Yeah, we had a young man who, who was uh, interested in parachuting, and he, uh, we marked out a circle on, on the ground, and he lobbed right in it, right in the middle of the circle. He was very clever. It's very good. All right, well, uh, apart from that, I don't have much news to tell you these days, um, except I am surviving in a retirement village. I never, ever thought that would happen. Um, but my wife has two widowed sisters there, and she said to me about four years ago, is it, honey? She said, I've followed you around for over 60 years. You can follow me this time. I'm going to my sister's. <laughs> so I didn't fancy sleeping on my own, so I meekly followed. And that's, that's where we are now. But um, it's, it's good that Noreen's here with me this morning and uh, Rowan. I appreciate Ashley's faith in her <laughs> to get up and down here without squashing him. Uh, and it's nice to have her husband with us today, Craig. Um, eight years ago, uh, Craig came and said to me, I'd like to marry your daughter. Well, I said, uh, you'll have to have an engagement. If you have an engagement, you've got to come and ask me first. So he came over to our home with his mother and with his auntie, Honey Betty. 
And uh, I said, all right, let's get on with this. So he gets off the chair where he was and heads straight across to Rowan. And I said, hey. And he did. In fact, he knelt before me. <laughs> and he said, I'd like to marry your daughter. I said, I'll think about it. <laughs> He said, oh, no, that's no good. So I said, all right, you can in 10 years. Oh, Rowan's turn, standing up off the seat. <laughs> Dad. So I said, all right, two years. That sounded pretty good compared to 10. <laughs> so they stuck to that, and then six, seven, seven years ago this month, they were married. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they're having a lot of fun. I get all the headaches, but never mind. It's, it's great that uh, they're both here with us to worship today. Um, I, I put as a title for today's sermon because I understood you were on the theme of well-being. So I simply listed it spiritual well-being. Isn't that the most important one? That's better than physical well-being, even mental well-being, spiritual well-being. And uh, as you listen to what I have to share with you, you'll probably wonder, what's, what's he talking about? What's... So you'll have to wait to the end, so please don't go out before the end, otherwise you'll miss what it's all about this morning. But, you know, one of the marvelous things to me in the Scripture is not only that God takes such a beautiful interest in his creation of birds that actually brought to us today, but the interest that he puts in us as individuals. You know, if you begin to think about it, right from the creation of the earth through the time of our Saviour, right up to the close of his history, the Bible always speaks of God dealing with individuals. How many people did he make? How many people did he make in the beginning? One. He made one. And the first thing he did was to meet the needs of that man. He says, it's not good that he's alone. I'll make a help meet for him. God shaped him with his own hands. He says he formed him out of the dust of the ground. And then he gave him CPR and kissed him as he breathed the breath of life into him. What a beautiful story that is of God's relationship with man. And he made him in his image. It's a beautiful story if you really stop and think about what we've just said. God of the universe stooping to this little planet and shaping one human being in his own image. Breathing the breath of life into his nostrils. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Very intimate. And God has always maintained that intimate relationship with his creatures. Always maintained that. Um, John 3.16 teaches us that wonderful truth. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you really understand what the text is saying? I'm sure you've heard lots of sermons on it. But the key to it is in the word whosoever. How many people are whosoever? All of us. No. Whosoever is one. Whoever believes. Not as 10 or 50 or 1,000, but if one believes. 
he will have eternal life. The intimacy of God in the gift of Jesus, for one. I can easily illustrate that. Uh, I could say, for example, if all of you meet me at the door after church, I'll give each of you $50 as you walk out. Yes, I see the memory. If I said, whoever comes to me after church, I will give $50. How many people would have to come? Come on, how many people would have to come if I said whoever? Just one. Isn't that right? Whoever comes will get it. And that's what John 3.16 says. That's the beautiful gospel story. That Jesus came even for one. And we need to understand that. Whoever comes. And then, then the close of scripture. We go from creation to the cross and to the close of scripture. And you're looking in Revelation 22. And if you've got your Bibles or your iPhones or smartphones or whatever, you've got iPads, you can look it up. Because in verse 17 is a very important statement. All right. Revelation 22, 17. It says, let what? Those. Is that what it says? Come on. You know when I come to preach, you've got to speak up. I'll talk to Pastor Okasini. <laughs> Tell him to let you speak. It says, let him come. Let him come. How many people said? Still back to one, aren't we? Still back to one. Let him who thirsts come. So whether we go to the beginning of creation, to the cross at Calvary, or to the coming of Christ, God is dealing with us as individuals. Do you get the point? You can't escape it. It's quite clear in the scripture. I love this passage in Psalm 33, and I want you to look at it with me because I hope that you'll keep this in your mind and mark it in your memory where you were looking. Um, Psalm 33. Uh, yeah. I'll get there directly. Just pay patience with me. That's a couple. There we are. Psalm 33. And I'm reading verses 14 and 15. Well, let's go back to 13. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the from place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. That's pretty inclusive, isn't it? Pretty inclusive, those statements. He sees all the sons of men. And then verse 15 says, He fashions their hearts, what? Individually. <laughs> he says, He says, All the inhabitants on the earth, but He fashions their hearts individually. We're all different. Even identical twins are not identical. I've got proof of that over the years. I've had identical twins under my care and youth leadership. And in every instance, I know they married different men. <laughs> so they weren't identical, were they? There were some things that appealed to one that didn't appeal to the other and so on. But identical twins are the nearest that we can get to saying there are people, two people alike. My wife gets worried when I say that. She says, you mean to tell me there's somebody else in the world that looks like you? That's hard. But never mind. But what a wonderful text that is, isn't it? He fashions every man's heart individually. That's why each one of us is so precious to God. Because I am the only one that he has of me. 
and you are the only one that he has of you. There is no other one like you, and there never has been. That's the wonderful creativity of God. My daughter and her husband used to love coming uh, to our place on Sabbath and watching the... Um, uh, what's the birds we watch? Great. What's the birds you've got at your place? The lorikeets, thank you very much. Just, uh, watch the lorikeets. And we've had up to 30 come feeding at a time. But you know, they're all different. They've all got different markings, all different depths of colour. So, so some of them hang upside down on, <laughs> on the clothesline, others of them hop like kangaroos. They're all different. Because God is a God that deals with all his creation individually. That's hard to grasp, isn't it? When you think of the great universe that exists, how small this planet is. And on this planet, he has placed every one of us individually. Does that make you precious to God? <laughs> if you're the only you that he's got, doesn't that make you precious to him? Who's got a 1935 penny? Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about when I'm saying pennies. There are only very few of them ever printed. And there was a lot of money now. So if you've got one, just give it to me. Don't worry about it. It's only a penny. Let me have it. Something that is rare becomes more valuable, doesn't it? You individually are rare. There is no other you. That's why you're so precious in the sight of God. It's a beautiful thing. He fashions them individually. Paul caught that wonderful truth when in Galatians 2.20 he says, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who what? Come on, you know this text. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you get it? Paul had it. Paul understood what I've been sharing with you this morning. He says, God loves me, and he gave his life for me. That's what brings spiritual well-being. When I recognize how important I am in the sight of God, his love's so great that Christ would be offered to die for me. That's, yeah, I say the same thing, sweetheart, yeah. yeah. And you know, uh, Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Thank you. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's interesting, uh, and I've looked at this so often because uh, it appeals to me. Um, in John 6, 37, he said, Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will what? In no wise cast out. Jesus was dealing with the individuals. The one that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And again in chapter 14 and verses 21 and 23, he who has my commandments and keepeth them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved to my Father, and I will love him and make my abode with him. Very clear, wasn't it? Jesus dealt with the individuals. And again he says, if any man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. It's so clear in Scripture if you look for it. It's so easy to read over these things and 
miss what God was really trying to say. He says, I know you because I made you and you're the only you I've got and I love you. So much so that my son will die for you. I love to read the stories in the New Testament of Jesus dealing with individuals. I've put down just a couple this morning. I'm sure we're, we're very much with them all. Remember the man with palsy that was brought by his four friends? <laughs> they shifted the roof of the house to let him through. What did Jesus say to him? Come on, what did Jesus say when they let the man with palsy through the roof? Your sins are forgiven. Wait a minute. His friends were probably saying, we didn't bring him for that. We brought him to get him well. <laughs> That's why we brought him. But Jesus knew the man and what his needs were. His need was to have freedom from guilt and condemnation. So the first thing Jesus said was, your sins be forgiven you. What about the woman with the issue of blood when Jesus was on the way to heal Jairus' daughter, from, well, to restore Jairus' daughter to life once more? Very timid individual, we don't know her name. Don't know very much about her at all, except that she had this issue of blood for 12 years. Only you ladies would really understand what was going on for her. She'd be anemic, she'd be weak, she'd be very depressed because, you know, in Jewish culture, a woman that was having a period was unclean. She couldn't go to church, couldn't fellowship with friends because she sat on the pew where you were sitting and then you came and sat there, you were unclean. Can you imagine a life like that? Must have been a terrible situation. So she gets where she should never have been. A bit like when you're in COVID. <laughs> she ventured to try and reach this Galilean and touch the hem of his garment. That's all she did. But Jesus made her know that he was aware who she was. And he spoke those beautiful words, go in peace and be healed. I'm sure she had never known peace for those 12 years. Never just that utter rejection. And Jesus gave her what she needed. All the children sing the song of Zacchaeus. <laughs> he wasn't liked by his fellow Israelites because he worked for the Romans, gathering taxes. <laughs> so small a statue, he had to climb a tree to be able to see the Christ going by. <laughs> and with all the people flocking about him, Jesus stops under the tree. He looks up and says, Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus? Did Jesus know him? Yeah. He didn't get introduced by anybody. He knew him. He said, Zacchaeus, come down out of there, because I'm going to your place for dinner today. And Zacchaeus' whole life was changed. And Jesus said to him, this day salvation has come to your house. Come to your house. The woman caught in the act of adultery and thrown at the feet of Jesus. We caught this woman in the very act of adultery. By their law, she should be what? To be stoned. It's not quite true because he should be too.
So Jesus stoops and he writes in the sand. Desire Ages tells us what he wrote. For in the sand he wrote the very sins of those who brought her. And he started with the oldest and went down the, the list to the youngest. And they all began to turn away. And finally Jesus looks at the woman and says, where are your condemners? Where are your accusers? Well, no, nobody's here. <laughs> and in those precious words to that woman, neither do I condemn you. Go sin no more. Amazing stories, aren't they? But sometimes we miss the second part of that story. He says, Jesus wrote where? Where did he write? In the dust, in the dirt, on the road. So when the people dispersed, what was going to happen with the record? <laughs> it was going to be wiped out as well. Jesus even showed kindness to those who accused the woman. What a God. A God that cares for all of us individually. The woman at the well of Samaria. <laughs> she came to get water. <laughs> So she left the child and went back into the sea. She didn't even get what she came for. She got more than what she came for. And it must, I really haven't got into the mind of this lady yet. He tells her all about his life. How many husbands has she had? Yeah, and the fifth one was not her husband. He was just a partner. And she goes into town, come see a man that tells me everything I've ever done. Whoa. <laughs> Did he know about it? Yeah, he knew what had been going on in her life. Did he love her? Yes. Did he offer salvation? Yes. There are so many stories in the scripture. And sometimes we think, well, you know, some people get mixed up in marriage relationships and uh, maybe God can't forgive them, but that's not what this is teaching us. Maybe we can be critical of other people, but God can forgive us. You know, all of these beautiful stories there are lessons for us to learn today. But the most important one is that he knows us individually and loves us. Um, uh, there was an occasion where Jesus was with his disciples, and I'm glad I wasn't with him because they'd come overnight <laughs> early in the morning and got out the boat and started to walk on the land. And the next minute, two crazy guys come out that had been sleeping in the cemetery where no one else would come at night, yelling and screaming and... Jesus, where were the disciples? <laughs> you read the story. They were all back in the boat. But Jesus was there with the man. He knew what had been going on in his life. He knew what he needed. And restored him, clothed him, and put him in his right mind. Jesus can do those kind of things because he knows what our need is. Every one of us had different needs. And it's illustrated in these beautiful stories this morning that we're just reminding ourselves of. And it doesn't matter where you fit in any of these stories, God knows you, he knows all about you. 
Jesus even does things for people that they could never dream of. Saul. On his way to Damascus with a letter of authority to take these Christians prisoners, bring them back to Jerusalem, put them in the jail. But on the road to Damascus, something happened. What was it? Come on, you're warming up slowly. By the time I finish, you'll be ready to go. What, what happened to him on the road to Damascus? Yes, he had the vision and heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Did God know what he'd been up to? Yeah. Did God know what he was going to do, plan to do? But more importantly, did God know what he was going to do with Saul? <laughs> see, when he appeared to Ananias, I said, Ananias, you better go over and see this man, Saul. Oh, not me, he says. I, I know what he's like. He's persecuted the people. He's here looking to take prisoners back to Jerusalem. No, thank you. Find somebody else. <laughs> and God said, no, you go. Because I have a purpose in life for this man. Would you have picked somebody like that to, to become the greatest Christian evangelist? Would you? No. But see, God knew him. And he knew he could take that enthusiasm that he had against the Christians and have it to work for the Christians. God knows more about you than you know about yourself. That's how intimate his knowledge is. What an amazing God. And you know, all the promises in the scripture we need to read this way. We need them as, to read them as promises that God is giving to me. When he said, I go to prepare a place for you, who was he talking to? Yes, yeah, to you. To you individually. When he says, when I come, I will receive you to myself, who is he talking to? He's talking to you, individually. When he says, my peace, I give to you, who is he talking to? You get the idea? We need to understand that the promises of God are for me as an individual. Because God knows me as an individual. He treats me as an individual. He loves me as an individual. And when he says, I'm with you always, he means you. He means me. In the good times and in the bad, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a promise. And it's just for you. Just for you. So I want to assure this morning that Christ knows every one of us individually. He knows our needs. He knows our trials. In fact, uh, again, in great controversy, as great of Asia says, his hand is outstretched in being tenderness to every suffering person. Those who suffer, uh, sorry, suffer most, have most of his sympathy and love. <laughs> what a God. There you go. And Paul tells us in Hebrews 4 and verse 15 that Christ sympathizes with our weaknesses and touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's touched with my weaknesses, my infirmities. That's what the scripture is saying. So uh, Satan may come and try to suggest to you that you're a hopeless case, that you're irredeemable, that God wants to lay your you to lay your perplexities and troubles at his feet. Through Peter he says, cast all your care upon him for what? He cares for you. 
he cares for you. So my message this morning is that God knows you, loves you individually. Your name is written on, the, on his nail scarred hands. And when he says, come to me, you that are heavy and heavy laden, he means just you. Just you. That's why David has that beautiful psalm in 139. He says, even in my mother's womb, you knit me together. You know me. You know all about me, he says. There isn't anything in my life that you do not see or know. So the truth, beloved, is simply this, that God loves each one of us as if there were not another person on earth. Did you get that? That's the same as where we started in John 3.16, isn't it? It says, whoever believes, God loves you as if you were the only one on earth. Uh, you understand that I love the book Desire of Ages. I'm always reading and quoting from it. Here's a little quote that's so important to me. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes, those hands so often uh, reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet, so tireless on ministries of love, spiked to the tree. And that royal head, pierced by the crown of thorns. Those quivering lips shaped in the cry of woe. And all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet. The agony that racked his frame and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face speaks to each child of humanity. It declares it is for thee that the Son of God contends, consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee, he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked the foam cap billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice. And this, from love to thee. You can't escape it, my dear friends. You can't escape it. God knows you individually. He died for you individually. He cares for you individually. And he's coming again for you individually. I simply say that this is the secret to spiritual well-being. An acceptance of the fact that God knows you, loves you, watches over you, that his death on Calvary was for you, that if you were the only sinner, he still would have come and died on Calvary for you. Can you say with Paul this morning, he loves me and he gave himself for me. What a God. And that's a lesson that I think we all need to learn if we want to be spiritually well. Just the depth of the love of God. We'll never understand it fully, not even in eternity. But to just try and grasp it is what I want us to do today. Just to understand how much God loves you, how important you are to him will be that which will inspire us and encourage us and make us prepared for the day when he will come for us. God bless you.